Hello, and welcome everybody to Udacity's Robotics q and I'm Mike Salem, and I'm here with CEO and founder of Let's Robot, Jillian Ogle. Jillian, how are you? Pretty good, how are you? Doing well, thank you. So thank you for stopping by, I appreciate it. Yeah. So let's talk about Let's Robot. So what exactly is Let's Robot? So Let's Robot is a uh, live streaming interactive platform for robots, and what we do is we allow people to control the robots that live stream video, like from the internet. Interesting, so kind of like Twitch, it sounds like a little bit in the sense of being able to see things that other people are doing. Yeah, a little, uh, it's a little bit like Twitch for robots. So I actually started this project by making robots controlled by Twitch, uh -huh. and there were some limitations to what you could do with their platform, so we decided to make a, like a custom one. Interesting. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your background and how, how you got into robotics. So sure. what, was, what was your path that you took to kind of get into robotics? Um, well, I actually started out as an artist. I was a professional artist for like 12 years oh or wow. something. Um, I was an art director at Disney Interactive, and then at some point uh, while working there, I switched over to game design, and so I worked on a couple of games as a designer. Mm -hmm. And then um, I left to do some independent projects, so I, I made a game on iOS and um, helped on a couple other indie projects. And once I ra wrapped up my iOS game, it was time for a new project, so I um, uh, was in the middle of prototyping like a new game concept, mm -hmm. and then I saw like Twitch Plays Pokemon happen, and uh, like I, if you guys aren't familiar with like Twitch or Twitch Plays Pokemon, like somebody hooked up the game Pokemon to Twitch.tv, which is like a live streaming service, and people were able to play the game Pokemon with the chat, and I thought that was pretty interesting. And, um, and then I had, had always had in my mind like doing stuff with robotics and I was just like, I put the two together and I was like, haha, I want to do that. So I basically taught myself how to make robots and hardware in order to realize the project. So that's interesting that you didn't have much of a hardware background before kind of starting yeah. this. You had your game de development background, right, and game design. So yeah. you were very familiar with that kind of process. You knew you wanted to do something kind of interactive, it sounds like. Yeah. What was it like learning hardware? Because I know for a lot of people, <laughs> for myself included, I had a really hard time when I started learning hardware. You know, I didn't come from that background. It's a little frustrating because it's a little overwhelming for me personally. Yeah. What was the experience like for you? Yeah, it's it, it's a little hard like once you get down at like the low level, but once you realize everything is like everything's just a bunch of wavy lines, um, like it's not it's not too bad, um, and you know, you do the research and you find things that uh, do what you want, so you, you get to use these big components, and I, and I think the accessibility of everything with Arduino and Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. is like you know becoming more and more accessible to non like super technical people. Right. Like if I had to make like a like a circuit board driver from scratch, sure. you know, uh, that would have been a lot harder than just buying a Raspberry Pi or buying like an Arduino kit and just downloading some software and like putting stuff together, sure. right? Yeah. 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 So in, in your experience, so we had um, we had Lewis Anderson from Traptic here last week, and mm -hmm. he was talking about using commercial off-the-shelf parts. Mm -hmm. It sounds like Raspberry Pi and Arduino, they're obviously you know, well-known products. You can yeah. pick them up pretty much anywhere. They're open source. They're, they're wonderful. Um, what is your opinion on kind of using those types of products for prototyping? Uh, I think they're great for prototyping because uh, they do a lot of things like out of the box, and you don't even realize all of the things that they're doing for you mm -hmm. um, until you try to not use them. And um, and like the nice thing is is like the Raspberry Pi like in particular is so well supported like mm -hmm. I can just Google almost any question I have and somebody has a solution for right. it right um, I mean there's better stuff probably but then like the the uh, you know what you can do with it isn't as accessible just because it's not as well supported or like you know the community sure. isn't there right yeah so. Uh, Talking about other types of hardware, I know there's some people out there who like, you know, NVIDIA's like Jetson TK series, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the considerations aside from like user community for something like a Raspberry Pi versus something like a Jetson, which is like $300 or so mm -hmm. for one of those boards? So uh, NVIDIA actually sent me a Jetson, both the TK1 and the T TX1, and I fiddled around with them. So, you know, the first thing is it requires a lot of setup. So like the Jetson TX1, for instance, like I had to have another Ubuntu machine in order to install the software mm -hmm. on the thing, and even then, it's even then there's like not a big community. So it's like this thing is super amazing. It's like a credit card 
size board, right? right? And um, you know, it ha it's about as strong as like a PS3 or a PS4. It's somewhere in between there, right? But it, you know, all of that, all of that capability is locked up on this thing that you know is hard for me to use because it, there's just so much low-level work that has to be done right. in order to utilize that well. So there's a lot of overhead for you to kind yeah. of kind of get going and yeah. not whereas allow you to solve the problem that you want. Yeah. Whereas with the Raspberry Pi, it's like you know, I want this bit of software, I want that bit of software, and somebody somewhere has already done it. There's like some open source project. Mm -hmm. You just download it. You you know, modify it as you need to and, and get going. And yeah. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, it, and it's usually enough to do like a proof of concept and you can always graduate to more advanced stuff later. But if you're, if you're just trying to like prototype and get stuff working, like, you know, you want to do things with the lowest entry point. So yeah. how long did it take you to kind of go from concept to prototype? Um, about a month, actually. Wow, it was very quick. Yeah, so the... So I did some research on hardware. Um, I messed around with like Arduino a little bit, and I put together like someone else's like robot kit. It was like a Robotus Darwin Mini something. Mm -hmm. So I did a I did a little bit of like experimenting with just hardware before I dug in, and then I decided to dig in. So I bought a Raspberry Pi. I bought all the components that I thought I needed, and uh, like I didn't know anything about. Um, mechanical engineering or know where to get parts to prototype robots, so I just use Legos. Okay. So the, the first robot I made was out of Legos, and it worked only with Twitch. So, um, so it took commands from the chat and it live streamed video to the Twitch video feed. And uh, yeah, and then I built a lot on top of that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then like more recently, we moved to this like online platform. So now it's made for robots. Yeah. Nice. So your, your platform, your chassis that you're doing, you started off with Legos, did you feel that was like an adequate place to kind of start <laughs> for your prototype? Or did you feel like, I really want to get off of this platform really quickly and into something that's more aluminum or you know 3D printed or custom molded? Oh, so like for the robot body, um, uh, I w I, sorry, I was talking about like the software platform oh, earlier. Oh, sure. But oh, yeah, but like for Lego for Mindstone. Th yeah, thing. for okay. the body, um, uh, yeah, I was using Legos, and that was just what I had around, right? Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we there's no platform, you know, for live streaming besides Twitch at the time. Um, like there was no Facebook Live yet, there was no Beam.pro yet. Like none of those sites even existed. Like when I started doing this, and um, and those have all like bub bubbled up like during the course of like developing this stuff. Interesting. Yeah. So I know you've had these robots here. You've been here for about 30 minutes or so <laughs> with us. Um, you've been running this one around the office quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty great. So I want you to kind of talk, talk me through this robot a little bit, if you don't mind. Okay. And kind of explain some of the hardware that's on here. Sure. Um, maybe your software stack. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about um, some of the limitations that you see with your current platform that you'd kind of like to see enhanced, mm -hmm. maybe going forward. And um, we can then move into maybe your community and kind of talk about the community around this as well. Sure, yeah. Um, so these robots are both kind of prototypes of what I call the Telebot model. And Telebot is basically a robot that's designed for live streaming to the internet and for user control. So like a few important features that it has is, um, you know, it has the text-to-speech, mm -hmm. which you were witnessing earlier. Yes, it was hilarious. So the people online can converse with you. Um, it has a microphone, so they can hear you back, obviously. It has a camera on the front of it, mm -hmm. and uh, that runs through a Raspberry Pi. And right now, we're doing compression with FFmpeg, and that goes okay. up to the server. Um, they have the RGB LEDs on the front. Sure. And um, in a previous iteration, like those were all user-controlled as well, and we'll get those controls back uh, soon. And um, and yeah, they, use, they both use microcontrollers. Uh, I think they both have Teensies in them which is a kind of a Arduino mm -hmm. type device. And uh, yeah, so it's like a microcontroller, Raspberry Pi, and then they both have independent Wi-Fi cards because I always have a lot of trouble with the Raspberry Pi's Wi-Fi sure. um, on board. Um, big lithium ion batteries, they both have grippers so they can get into trouble. Um, yes, we yeah. had them running around untying people's shoelaces. Yeah, so un untying shoelaces. It's, it's quite a lot of fun to watch, actually. Yanking cords off desks. Um, yeah, grabbing toes. Uh, <laughs> they they all they like to do those things. So <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming when you first started this, or even now, you probably test a lot of these things at home. What kind of trouble have you seen when you've opened them up for people to play with? Like, what, what kind of situations are you like, 
oh no, I didn't, I didn't expect it to go over and grab this wire, or, you know, I lost a lamp off of a table, or... Well, I, I mean, robot proofing your house is a little bit like <laughs> child proofing. Yes. Um, so, like, you have to, th you know, whatever, whatever they can mess with, they'll mess with. So cords, you know, you got to make sure what's ever on the ground they can't do. Like, if I have them on in my house, like, you know, I'll, I'll be looking for my shoes and the shoes will be stuffed, like, one's under the bed, like, <laughs> one's under the couch. And, um, like, my co-founder, Rick, uh, there was an incident where, like, he had some important documents that they managed to grab off a desk because one of his robots had a big arm. Oh. So it was able to like reach and and pull some stuff and then pull the documents off and then it went and he's at work while this is happening. So, so he left it, he left yeah, it live at home. Yeah, it's so like a dog at that yeah, point, right? So actually, he has like a group <laughs> of four robots that are always on in his house. So um, yeah, and he went and there's a video on YouTube of this too. And he you know and the robot just like drops the s documents in the toilet because they <laughs> they can. Um, <laughs> So yeah, they'll they'll get into trouble. I mean, it's you, you but you've got to just be aware that you know there's people controlling them, so they'll do whatever they can do usually. Um, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> that's, that's actually really funny. I can't imagine coming home and having four robots roaming around my house and then realizing <laughs> nothing is where I had left it. <laughs> so. Um, Talking about, I know you mentioned earlier for your video, you talked about FFmpeg. Mm -hmm. Just curious, how many frames per second are you able to pull from? Um, actually, I actually don't know that number. Um, so the, we're, it's probably 20 to 30 frames. It okay. could be more. Like, uh, I, I've done some tests myself where we get up to 60 frames and like, like I, um, like the new technology, like the we just sort of switched technologies mm -hmm. on these robots. So, and since I'm working with like proper engineers now, they they know all the things. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think it. I think it's around 30 right now. Okay, yeah. great. And you mentioned also you had some spotty issues with Raspberry Pi's Wi-Fi. That seems yeah. to be a common theme with most people who, uh, who end up using you know the Wi-Fi built inside of the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Which kind of which channels are you using for Wi-Fi? Are you using N or are you using AC or? Right. So I find that if you're, especially in the Silicon Valley or San Francisco where sure. I live, 2.4 gigahertz is mostly slammed. You yeah, can't no do good. In it, yeah. And you'll usually, so I have dual band Wi-Fi cards on both of these robots. And then the other problem the Raspberry Pi has, aside from the fact that the Wi-Fi on board is a little weak, is I. Um, I don't know if it's fixed now, but I know at some point it had a lot of problems with like network logic too. Mm -hmm. So it would also get really confused if you were in an area with a lot of SSIDs. So I found that just using like an independent like Wi-Fi module, like there's these like a little thing called like a TP-Link 150. Okay. So it's like a little mm -hmm. personal Wi-Fi router, mm -hmm. and it's powered by USB. And uh, so you can actually just take a card like that, and that'll handle all the internet stuff, and you just Ethernet it into the Pi. And that, that's been way more stable than anything else that I've used. That's good to know. Yeah, so I mean, th that, that one's a little old. There's some newer ones that um, I wish I could remember what they are off the top of my head. But there, there's a, yeah, you just look up like personal Wi-Fi router, um, portable something, and you'll, you'll find something. OK, yeah. very cool. So I want to talk about your gripper a little bit because yeah. it's actually really sturdy. <laughs> how, how many pounds can your, your gripper hold? Do you know? It depends sure? on the servo. Okay. Uh, so, uh, like, you could put a high torque servo in there. Sure. Like, I have a couple of like much stronger robots. Um, ev even though we might be using like the same hardware, like if you just have a servo that has like ten times more torque, mm -hmm. like these guys can grab a couple pounds. Um, so definitely carry a coke can. Yeah, they back can. And forth. Yeah, they can carry a coke can. They can carry a shoe. Um, <laughs> As you've discovered yeah. several times, probably. Small animals, yeah, um, yeah that, <laughs> that kind of thing. And de definitely documents from a, from a paper or yes, from a desk, Yes, definitely right? documents, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so talking about, uh, kind of going back to that, that story about the documents on the desk and having four robots kind of roaming around the house <laughs> at all times, I, I just can't get this, this vision out of my head of just seeing these robots just running around, picking things up and throwing them in different places. Mm -hmm. um, what's a typical charge like on, on one of those robots? So uh, we have robots that sort of work at various levels. Mm -hmm. So uh, Rick's robots uh, have giant batteries in them. So they run like 20 something hours. Oh, and wow. And they can self-charge. So he has like docking stations there. Oh, OK, great. So they can just like go to sleep and dock. 
Um, these things will last between six and eight hours. And then we're actually making a uh, prototype that we're going to be selling online. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we, we have a small number of prototypes that we uh, for Telebot that you can buy online right now for two ninety nine, and those have um, uh, those will last like a few like three or four hours. Wow, that's a pretty good charge. Yeah, and they're tiny too. They're like even smaller than these these robots. Yeah. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about your your software stack that you have built into these things. Mm -hmm. So. You're using a Raspberry Pi, so my, my guess is you're obviously running some form of a Linux platform. Yeah, we're using Raspbian. Okay, so you are using just the standard Raspbian. You didn't go with an Ubuntu Mate, Mate mm -hmm. or no. 14, 04, 16, 04 L LTS or anything like that. No, there's like a specific di distribution of Raspbian we're sort of locked into right now, and I think that's just because FFmpeg hasn't been updated to mm -hmm. the latest distro. So um, you, you have to look at the documentation on the site, and that should have it listed there. But Aside from that, yes. So are, are you're using an external or like a USB camera versus a, the Raspberry Pi cam, or are you using the You Pi can use well? either one. Uh, I use Raspberry Pi cams uh, mm -hmm. mostly because they're nice. Right. Yeah. You get a lot of functionality, you get yeah. a lot of lower level functionality. Yeah. So interesting. Great. Are you using ROS or anything like that, or what, what kind of messaging systems are you, are you using? There's no ROS. Um, the robot internal logic is actually very simple since they're all user controlled. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they don't have to have a whole lot of logic, mm -hmm. you know, internally. Um, so it's just like a simple serial USB connection from the Raspberry Pi to the microcontroller. And, and that's about the only interface we have right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's nice and simple. Yeah. Easier to debug, right? Yeah. And then the Raspberry Pi, that's what talks to the server. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so talking a little bit about your community and how, how these games are played, can you <laughs> talk a little bit through like your, some of your typical scenarios outside of like your house and maybe people stealing your shoes or throwing away expensive and important documents? Sure. Um, so when I actually started Let's Robot, my goal was to make like the world's first live interactive show. Mm -hmm. And I thought like robots would be a good way to do that. And that's why I started on Twitch. and um, and. I was streaming the robots a lot to Twitch, and like a lot of the early things that I would do mm -hmm. is, you know, since my background is games, like I, I started making like dungeons out of cardboard and foam in okay. my living room for like the robots to explore and play with, and I had like stories and quests and like other other robot characters that like run around, and so we had, you know, we still have people, even though it's been kind of a year or more since I've done that aspect of it, mm -hmm. like we still have people who are like big fans of of that and like the characters and, and stuff like that that we used. And um, I don't know, like the, the community has actually been pretty nice. Like I was expecting a lot more chaos. And uh, you know, you always get the occasional like person that comes in and you know, curses a bunch and you know, tries, yeah. tries to sort of you know, troll everyone, but it's not that hard to weed it out. And you know, as I guess as long as you deal with it quickly, it usually doesn't get too bad. Right. Um, but yeah, it, it, the community has been great. They've been really supportive. Um, like my, I've got to know a lot of people personally because mm -hmm. uh, I was, like I said, I was streaming to Twitch before. Yeah. And uh, so I'm a partnered streamer on Twitch as well. And we have like, we have like several thousand followers on there oh, wow. and subscribers and, and stuff like that. And yeah, there's some pretty cool people. Very cool. Yeah. So talking about your dungeon kind of theme that you yeah. have, is it all, are they all roughly the same type of robot or did you have different types of robots in there that, that had different skills that they had to work together and kind of collaborate? Yeah, so the first two robots I made had different, uh, different tools. Mm -hmm. So one of them had like a hacky sword arm, the other one had like a gripper. So I would try to make little puzzles that they'd have to do together and coordinate. And uh, you know, li they spend about half their time actually kind of playing along and the other half trying to escape and destroy everything. <laughs> so you've, yeah, I guess you've got to take that into account. Um, but yeah, like the idea is, you know, you can, I mean, any, anything a robot, any kind of robot pretty much, like we want to be able to just like hook, hook, hook stuff up, like bipedal robots, like complicated Mars rover type things or, you know, simple things that aren't, too much different than a Roomba. Sure. <laughs> so, so it sounds like your model is more or less, um, the robots are an important piece of the model, but there's yeah. still a bigger overarching theme, which is being able to control things and have user engagement 
kind of as you move forward. Right? Yeah, so the idea is that we wanted to make live streaming interactive mm -hmm. and phys like, you know, like actual interactive and, and physical, right? So instead of just watching somebody, so, you know, you're the, the paradigm, like, up until more recently has been I just sit and content comes at my face, you yeah. know, from a TV, right? right? It's, it's one way. And maybe at first you could write in, you could call in, there's a studio audience, right? Mm -hmm. And then like when the internet came around, like you have like, you know, game shows and new shows that try to, you know, have their own like social media pages. They're like, hey, tweet us and we'll read your tweet on the air, mm -hmm. right? Um, <coughs> but what I see, and, and, ev and even though we have like live streaming services that have popped up from like Facebook and from Twitter and you know, all these other places, it's still kind of that paradigm, even mm -hmm. though we have these computers that are interactive, right? And you can sure. have a conversation, right? Right, And you can do more than just watch, you can participate. So we want, we want to enable that, like we want that, uh, we want that like content, you know, to be a two-way conversation mm -hmm. between you and like whatever you're watching or whatever you're doing. So instead of like reading tweets on the air, Right, like a news van could pull up and it has like a bunch of robots in it and you could just set them down and like let people just see what's going on, like what, what, what's happening at the scene, right? Right. Like that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's really cool. So if I were on the other side of this, let's say I'm sitting at home and I'm on my computer mm -hmm. and I'm like, I want to log into one of your robots and mm -hmm. kind of participate. How do I control the robot? What are the commands for, let's say, a general one like this? Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, they're they're live right now, by the way. So you can check it out on runmyrobot.com, and um, and yeah, and if you go there, you'll see you'll it'll land you on one of the robots that's live, and then there's usually basic controls like forward, back, left, right, and you can use like the arrow keys so to to make it go. So similar to the way you play games, W S A D or. Uh, well, we use the we use, use the actual arrow keys. Yeah, we use the arrow keys. Okay. We use the keyboard letters to chat. So okay. Yeah. Oh, I got you. Just to just to keep it easy, and sure. then there's, uh, like, we can put a bunch of custom buttons at the top, mm -hmm. and this is all like super early prototype, by the way. So, like, things are still very very much loosey goosey, um, but uh, yeah, like you can add a lot of different buttons. It doesn't just have to be basic controls. Um, like we've hooked up like robot arms. Like I one of the robots that I have at home is like kind of a Mars rover mm -hmm. replica, and it has like a lot of different things that it can do. And you know, all you do is you press a button and watch the robot do stuff, and um, you know. And then we're also working on tools to um, aggregate everyone's input. So if you get like a lot of people on one robot, like um, you know, it's still kind of a fun and interesting experience, and right. you can still influence like what's going on. Yeah, that was one of the things I was going to ask you. Is I'm sure there's a lot of people logging into a single robot at, at one time. What's that process kind of like? <laughs> is, do, is it something like somebody's trying to move the robot forward, somebody else is trying to turn it, and it's just it's kind yeah. of going crazy? Or is it more like you have a set, you know, you have five seconds with this robot, do whatever you want to do, and then it moves to the next person? Um, it's actually all of the above. So <laughs> uh, it's up to whoever, like, so instead of a broadcaster, we call them, like, robocasters. And it's up to the robocaster, like, what kind of stuff they want to allow users to do. Um, our tools are very limited right now, but uh, if th you want to open it up to just like one person or a close group of friends, that's one thing. Um, but we also want to be able to accommodate like 10,000 people being mm -hmm. on a robot. Sure. Because um, for us, that's the way the platform scales, right? right? Um, and like as a game designer, um, like I have, you know, we've, we've developed a lot of different control methods and we're going to implement something soon that I think will work really well for that. So, so you keep mentioning your, your game design background. How crucial do you feel it is to have that game design background when you started this? Did you feel that that's something that you could have kind of picked up along the way, or did you feel like that's a really core, like, fundamental piece? That's a core fundamental piece to, like, how I think about the world. Sure. And, like, what, what I do and the kind of stuff I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I started as an artist, like, I didn't realize like at the you know because I was into video games and I didn't have a computer and I played video games and I'm like oh these games are pretty like you know right. most of making a game is the art and the story and and stuff like that and then and then you you know you get a job and like you start to learn like how all of this stuff actually works and you and you're like oh you know what like I actually want to do that like that's that mm -hmm. you know this is cool but that's that actually is more to the meat right. of what I want to do um, and so like I'm always 
thinking about just like how people like use things and how people would or react to things mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that, which gives me a lot of anxiety too. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it, it's it's just sort of a mode of of like how I you know operate, right? Right. And um, and yeah, I, I think it's important, like when going into this project, because I think I'm pretty sure, like at the time, mm -hmm. and that started to change a lot as sure. well. Is that there weren't hardly any game designers working in robotics, right? Um, and like, you know, companies are starting to, you know, target those people, you know, for consumer-based robotics now because of AR and all the interactive right. stuff that's starting to bubble up. Um, so I, I think it was a good key differentiator in the beginning. Right. Like if you have a game designer working with this robotics company, like you know it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's something I see kind of time and time again when I see some of these new companies and these innovative and creative companies kind of coming out. Is someone has some really specific doma domain knowledge mm -hmm. that may or may not be directly applicable to robots at the time, mm -hmm. but with a little modification, all of a sudden it opens up this whole new world, which it sounds like basically what you've done here, right? With Using your game design background, you're actually able to kind of come up with a new idea, a new new way of interacting yeah. with you know the real world and uniting people kind of from all over the world. Yeah, yeah, and then like I like to say, because instead of like a you know a telepresence robot where you have like one user sure. and one rose robot, like what this is is essentially like crowd presence mm -hmm. where you have many people, you know, and you give them access to like one experience um, that they wouldn't have otherwise. So, so talking about building these robots and kind of maintaining, because there's a lot of working pieces here, right? You have to make sure that you have bandwidth so that you can actually have people steer these things. You mm -hmm. have to make sure your latency is relatively low so that people don't get frustrated. How big is your team? Uh, our core team is three people. Wow. So there's me and my co-founders, Rick, okay. Rick Julie, and Theodore Lee. And uh, so like I'm kind of the more creative type mm -hmm. and like I have, I've developed- But you're technical too. Let's technical not, too, yeah. Let's like, not downplay that, right? Yeah. So I, I do a lot of things because I have to do them, but it's not necessarily like my like core mm -hmm. skill set. And uh, so it's it's you know and like Rick's working on like a lot of the the robot software, and uh, Theo's working on a lot of the server side stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we also have like kind of uh, people who like help out quite a bit. And uh, it, you know if, if we get some m money we'll probably want to hire a couple of sure. them for real for realsies um, and there's probably a you know three or four people who contribute to the project otherwise on a regular basis now when you say contribute do you mean people is it like an open source portion of this or is it more close Mo most of it is open source actually so um, we I mean the only the only thing that like we maintain that's a little closed off is the the, the server sure. side stuff right but like the plans for the robots, the software that runs them, um, that's all open source. Like I even have, we even have like CAD models of stuff online. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty much anything like uh, that we can open up, we're trying to open up and making things accessible and easy for people. And how do you feel that's been as part of your business model kind of going forward? Do you feel it's been a really great thing allowing you to get a lot of work done quickly or? Um, it's nice to see people contribute. Um, I don't think we've been like around long enough to know sure. like as a business strategy how right. open sourcing things will affect us, but I think it's the right move. Um, and I think it will, you know, help us succeed in the end. And so you, you mentioned that you have somewhere around the lines of thousands of followers, right, mm -hmm. for, for this product. Mm -hmm. What is the most people that you've seen online at one time? In, in your own personal opinion, like? Oh, well. For, for a single robot, let's For say. a single robot, so we've had a couple, well, I, I've had a couple streams on Twitch where um, we've hit about 5,000 people. At the same time? At the same for, time. For one robot? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like that, that to me sort of like demonstrated the need to have like a custom platform that sure. was designed for this stuff. And um, like we're like the the web platform is still fairly new. I think mm -hmm. we have about ten thousand monthly active users on it right now. Mm -hmm. um, but you know there are those occasional sp huge spikes that we get from Reddit posts and everything breaks and and then we have to figure out how to fix it and it's fun. But yes, yeah. interesting. <laughs> so you had some challenges that you did. You did some dungeon style mm -hmm. work. You can you know deploy these kind of anywhere mm -hmm. and let people just kind of let them roam around and 
and explore the world, if you will. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other like themes or things that you would like to do? Well, so uh, there, there's so much stuff. Like we want to do battle bots. Like we'd want to send them out to like in the middle of the wilderness and let them explore. Send them out to like you know new like places and like when news is happening. Mm -hmm. Like you know there's a volcanic eruption, but it's too dangerous to send in humans. But right. we have these disposable robots. Um, one of the one one of the kind of more interesting things we did is. Um, so, like, we made a robot that play, plays Pokemon Go. Okay. And it actually holds an actual phone, and uh, it has a it has a um, X Y plotter on it, so it could use the stylus on okay. the phone. And um, and it's made for out. So it's an all terrain robot. It's it's another one of those Mars rover clones, and uh, and so you know it can go anywhere. And um, yeah, so we took it outside. We let it play Pokemon Go. It used the phone. It caught caught a few Pokemon and I got an email from one of the users like uh -huh. randomly and they wanted to stay anonymous but you know the, the email was essentially like hey like thanks for hooking up this robot that plays Pokemon Go like you know I really wanted to play the game but I can't because I have um, like I'm paralyzed oh, like wow. you know so like he was a uh, uh, paraplegic mm -hmm. and like couldn't really like go out and participate and do all of this you know, do this game that everybody else was doing, sure. but you know, with like Let's Robot, he was able to just like log in, like hang out with people and have fun, like doing this thing that like all these other people, you know, take for granted. Right. And like that's the kind of stuff that I think, you know, just giving people access, right, right, um, to to stuff like that is just yeah, is a win for me. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. So. I know you're kind of focused on the on the gaming side of things, right? Obviously, that's that's your background. That's the thing that you're very passionate about. Yeah. Um, but there's also a lot of application I, I can see for these things in mm -hmm. other places, as you had mentioned, exploring a volcano, or um, you know, a, a news scene. Mm -hmm. Is there any interest for like a scientific community? There could be, yeah. I mean, like you could you could outsource some of your field research to the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we've been approached by a couple of. Uh, like sign like research based companies mm -hmm. and like played with the idea of like letting you know crowd crowdsourcing some of their research because they have like research robots that do things like you know mix chemicals or different things mm -hmm. and you know it was like oh well let's see if, if users can concoct like different you know chemicals and, and see what they come up with like with this robot you know as long as they're working with a certain parameter so yeah I, I could definitely see um, you know, putting putting a bunch of brains to work. You know, uh, doing something. Yeah, it's a very interesting way of collaborating, right? Yeah. So you could have scientists from all over the world working on the same project in the same lab, essentially. Yeah. Without being there. Yeah. So it's fantastic. So I gotta ask you: Can we turn one of these back on? Sure. Yeah. 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 So these they're both off right now, so because they get kind of noisy. I'm gonna turn on the one with the quiet motors, but let me see if I can stuff its little. USB. Do we want TTS on or off? Um, I don't know. I think we can we can start with it. Let's start with it on and let's see if it becomes a problem. Then All we right. can turn it off. Let's play with so fire. Keep it clean out there, please. <laughs> so when when you brought this in earlier, it was just talking up a storm. This one yeah. was in particular. Yeah. And you know, it attacked my <laughs> shoes and tried to go for shoelaces, which I don't have any. But um, it grabbed a couple of our, our crew members' feet, grabbed a couple of, of people's you know shoes and shoelaces and untied them. So let's see um, what the community will do. Mm. I was having some electrical issue earlier that I thought I fixed, but I just saw it boot twice. So. But we'll see if this one actually. So let's talk about kind of what, what's on this robot. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked a little bit about this one. Is it roughly the same, the same components? Is it still a yeah. Raspberry Pi with Teensy? Yeah, it's uh, just a little bit more refined. And like maybe the biggest difference aside from the shell is the fact that it has um, just quieter motors. Mm -hmm. So this one, you know, like. I tested this one with a few places, and they're like, "Oh, hey, the motors pick up on on the mic," because I was talking to like a uh, like a news group who was thinking about using one of these, and they're like, "Hey, the motors pick up on the mic." Um, so Hello, there we go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so um. 
Um, yeah, I don't have. <laughs> I don't have volume control uh, independently for it yet, so we're we're gonna work on that. <laughs> so I like the idea that it's um it, it's a okay, one single voice, and yeah. it's not multiple voices from other people using their mic and kind of transmitting their voices through, because otherwise it gets kind of um, overwhelming. I guess is probably the best way to. to yeah, write like it. if there were two people well, talking at once, so it would be hard to to understand. <laughs> So you said the battery life for one of these is roughly that. around three hours? Oh, this is around six to eight hours. Okay. Um, and uh, the ones that we're selling right now oh, are about three to four. Okay, yeah. great. And how much are they selling for? Are they two ninety nine. Okay, great. Yeah, they're, they're we're selling a handful of those uh, tele telebot prototypes. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, there's a couple other, there's like one cheap robot that we're selling, like the GoPi Go, and then um, there's another one. That's uh, if you if you just want like a big robot that has a giant battery and lasts forever, um, we've got one of those too. If you want to buy one, no, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so it looks like it, somebody in the uh, oh, on your stream has grabbed one of the the bottles. Yes. Let's see five five points if you can bring it back to me. <laughs> so you're you're lined up. Hmm? Too much delay. Too much delay. Yeah, You're there might backwards. be some delay here. Wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is great. So I know we have a bunch of questions from our community. No, no <laughs> so let me go ahead and take some of those questions. Did you? Are we okay? Okay. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> so I have uh, I have a you question here point. from. Param Raj Rajpura. Hi, Jillian. Turn off the voice. Okay. One sec. Sure, no problem. Right. Sorry. Ah. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn off your speakers. I can see. <laughs> it said I can't see. Shh. In case anybody was wondering. <laughs> okay. So the question is, Hi, Jillian. It's inspiring to see you blending creativity with robotics. What motivates you to keep going every single day? Or are there days when you creativity fuel is low? Hmm. Um, well, I, I think when you're creative, like you just sort of have to to learn to like enter that mode at any time. Mm -hmm. So it, it sort of I guess it's when I was younger, I sort of like struggled with like motivation. Um, but I, I I think as long as I have like a Good purpose. Like I don't, I don't need like that much motivation. It, it's just I, I think lacking motivation for me was more like being overwhelmed by anxiety, mm -hmm. like rather than like not being motivated. Sure. It's just that like you know I want to do all of these things, but oh my god, like all of these like doubts and other things, and like I'm too dumb or whatever else. Like you know that just all gets in the way. The act of being a perfectionist is not yeah. wanting to fail at something. Yeah, and then you know if you just sort of relax and you let yourself like kind of enter that like, you know, um, mode where you can create, where, mm -hmm. you know, you just sort of let that stuff bubble up in your head. Um, you know, you just need to be able to, like, turn, turn, turn that on. And, you know, you, it's, like, you, you, it's like training. You do it every day. Right. Yeah. So you, d you don't have to, yeah. You, you don't <laughs> have to get into that mode anymore. <laughs> yeah. So the next question is, with a background of a designer slash artist, what are your comments on the aesthetics of robotics? So this is actually a really good question. Yeah. Most of the people we've, we've talked to are usually hardware or software engineers. Yeah. So having a designer in is, is kind of an interesting yeah. uh, interesting take. That was one of the reasons why I thought like it might be fun to get into robotics as well, is because um, like I, there's a lot of ugly robots out there, right? And um, you know there's a lot of bias because in the media robots are portrayed as like these horrible antiquated machines. Yeah, and or, well not antiquated evil. like but killing machines. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know we can make them we can make them nicer. We can you know make them friendly. We can merge with them <laughs> um, in some way or work together with them. And uh, uh, yeah, like so. There's a lot of ugly robots, and I want to make not ugly robots. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. So the next question is from Al from Adam. Hello, Jillian. Thank you for taking our questions. 
What do you feel is the minimum team size and the roles necessary to go to market with a consumer robot? Um, you don't have to have a big team, and it, it depends on what your goals are as a company. So, like, we're actually not, I wouldn't consider us a robotics company. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually working with another robotics company to help us develop our robot. So, even though I've, you know, we all, everyone on the team has had experience building robots mm -hmm. now, um, you know, our core. Our core business model is actually focused on the platform. Sure. And um, you know, if you're just focused on like one kind of robot, like, and you know, you're willing to take on like wearing a few hats, like you, you know, go build your prototype, do do a thing. Um, I would recommend though, if you're m interested in the startup scene and you want to get funding and you want to build a team, build your team early. Mm -hmm. And if the team falls apart, build another team like sure. right away. That's, that's actually really good advice. Yeah, and um, you know, and start start talking to people. Start talking to investors. Start talking to angel investors. Just get the just start those conversations. Get to know those people. Network. Like, you know, you don't. Nothing has to come of it yet, but you know, you'd, you'd be amazed at where stuff can lead sometimes. Sure. Yeah. Great, great advice. So this next question is from Shen Yu. Hi, Jillian. Is it possible that people can upload their algorithms to your robots? If uh, right now, whatever logic is happening on the robot is, uh, is on the robot. So if you want to run an al algorithm of some kind, like locally on the Pi, um, like you can totally do that. And, um, it, and it, you know, is because all you're outputting is the video and you're hooking up controls. And whatever you want to put in there is fine. On the other side, we're working on, like, in the future, we do want to support stuff, you know, on the client side. So if, if we want to mess with, uh, like, computer vision apps mm -hmm. or, you know, like, we were, we were talking about, like, hooking the rob just hooking the robot's video feed up through, like, Google's Cloud Vision API. Right. So, like, we can identify all the random stuff on the floor. That would be fun. Yeah. So, yeah, we want to we do that kind of stuff. Um, like making it accessible for like normal people to use, but then we also want to like you know you should be like we also want to be able to like remote program robots and stuff as well. Right. Yeah. That's a big that's a big piece I think. It's yeah. very cool. So this next question is from Kadu Aaron Missouri. Hello, Ms. Jillian. <laughs> Does Let's Robots do some outsourcing talented robotic engineers in Africa, so Uganda in particular, to start work at Let's Robots? Um. We like I I think that we would definitely want to outsource in the future. Right now we're we're a very small team. Uh, we're still trying to secure our seed funding. Sure. Um, so we're in the middle of that process right now, and uh, I'm hoping that after that we'll have a little extra money to like hire a little bit of help. Mm -hmm. But um, it'll probably be it'll probably be a few months yet before we can like really ramp up. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm sorry. He's trying to pull the cord out of the out of the wall. <laughs> Pretty funny, actually. <laughs> yeah, we'll just we'll nice just try. <laughs> <laughs> so, this next one is from Guy Pavlov. What wireless solution do you use for video transmission? Wireless. So, like I like I said before, we don't use the well. We we do use the, the Pi's onboard Wi-Fi sometimes, but my preference is to use just a totally external card. Um, the favorite thing that I have found so far is something called the Netgear WNCE 3001, mm -hmm. and that's a dual band Wi-Fi card, and it's USB powered, so it's easy to integrate into something small like a robot. It's about the size of a credit card. Okay. And um, like it's, I don't, I think it's been discontinued, but there are other similar like pieces of hardware that have popped up. And uh, we just started using a new one, and I, I can't remember what it is off That's the top okay. of my head. You can always tell me later. Yeah. I, I can, I'm happy <laughs> to put that in our community so they have an answer for it. So the next question is from Alejandro Mejore. Are you using Arduino to build the bots? What is the hardware that you're using? So I think we talked about this one a little bit, right? A little bit, yeah. So the microcontroller is a Teensy, and you can totally use an Arduino instead. It, they're very similar. and. Um, and like it doesn't it doesn't even have to be like the only thing you have to keep in mind is the Pi is a is a GPU, right? So mm -hmm. it's running a bunch of processes in parallel, which means the timing is going to 
be variable. So if sure. you're trying to control something with like pulse width modulation, right, right, that needs very precise timing. Like the Pi is not really going to work out, like you know, for too many components. Mm -hmm. So you have to use a microcontroller of some kind. So you, you know, there's things that you could just stick on top of the Pi mm -hmm. and it'll take care of that for you. Or you could, you know, serial in an Arduino or a Teensy and then um, like that, that'll, that'll work as well. So as long as you have something that has like a lot more, you know, that's designed for controlling hardware, like integrated in there somewhere, like that'll work out a lot better than just a standalone pie. <laughs> so. so the next question is, what is your concrete commercial potential from the robots that you were building? So it sounds like what's kind of like your go-to-market strategy. So our go-to-market uh, our go -to -market strategy is more, so Let's Robot is a content distribution platform, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, like we would, we're thinking of these robots like not as like a particular consumer product. They're more like, to me, like, cameras, interactive right. cameras of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And like, Let's Robot is the place that you go to to use these robots that live stream. And, um, you know, similar to Twitch, where, you know, you just log in and you watch somebody play a video game, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, they were bought by Amazon for a billion dollars, right. you know, uh, like a couple of years ago. And I, I think that particular year they made like a billion and a half in revenue. And, you know, most of their monetization comes from, you know, partnering with broadcasters and people who create content. You know, it's much like how a television, like, station works, right? right? You, you have your, the core group who creates the content, and then you have everybody else consuming the content, and then there's a lot of channels to monetize that. Gotcha. Um, so, the next question is, what skills should I have to learn robotics? I'm going to take that a step further and say, if I wanted to work at a place like Let's Robot. Mm -hmm. Well, if you just want to get into robotics, there's nothing really stopping you. There's a lot of stuff that um, lets you get into it early. So um, I started with a robot called the Parallax Activity Bot. Okay. bot. So um, Parallax is a big educational robotics company. And um, plug. Plug. Yeah. <laughs> and um, they're, you know, they've been really helpful to us. They're actually uh, helping us develop our own robot right now and um, you know but they just had this kit right that I could put together and it had everything that I needed and I learned a lot about robots just like right. putting this together and you know and like you, there, you, it's hard to shortcut like you know four or six year like you know mechatronics engineering right. degrees and, totally. and, and stuff like that right but you could totally get into that kind of stuff. And like for a company in particular, like Let's Robot, l like, um, you know, I, I think that we're going to, I think that we're going to hopefully be one of those companies that is able to open up like working with robots to more people than just engineers. Right. Um, because, you know, like it, it's this thing that you can just have work with you or alongside you or, yeah, yeah. Um, Hope so, anyway. Yeah. I definitely agree. I, I feel like building, actually getting your hands dirty and starting to build is, is one of those skills that if, if you want to work with robots, you, it's almost mandatory. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because if you want to do anything, it's mandatory. Yeah. You just, like, dig in and do it. And, like, you know, you, you, you screw up and you do it again, and you do it slightly better. And are you, yeah. are you aware of the rule of hardware, which is always buy two? Right? Oh, I buy two? I, I learned that at my first job. Huh. So my, my mentor told me, always buy two, and I asked him why. He goes, because you're going to fry the first one. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I've sort of uh, in, in, yeah, independently right. learned that rule. Yeah, <laughs> it's like tribal <laughs> knowledge for people who worked <laughs> with hardware before. So um, next question is from uh, Roy Nielsen. Mm -hmm. He said, have you ever used your thought about using your robots for search and rescue? Um, that, that could be possible, yeah. I mean, that I, I think something like that would just sort of be a, um, emergent um, thing that would happen, you know, it's, you, you have enough robots out there and doing different things in, in, in enough places, like stuff like that is just going to happen. Yeah. Right. And if, I don't know if there's room for, for focusing on that as a use case, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So this next question is from Gina Longo. Hey Jillian, 
a lot of our students come from the programming side of tech, mm -hmm. which tends to have a lot of gender imbalance. Mm. What unique challenges do you see women in the robotics industry facing? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a thing. Uh, like working in si Silicon Valley, um, when, I w when I was in art, uh, in games, like it was a little bit more balanced, but it's still mostly men. Mm -hmm. um, and as, especially like the three, 3D games, so like console and PC is, is, is still pretty dominated by men. Um, the, I mean, and it, that's just in a lot of places. Um, and I, I think that, I think, I don't know, it's hard. Like for me personally, like, like that's something I want to handle like in my company is like I want to make sure that you know there's more women involved mm -hmm. right and it and it's hard like um, you know I tried to get interns last year um, for Let's Robot and I tried to get a lot of you know a lot of female interns sure. and it was hard to find like a like an electrical engineer or a mechatronics engineer mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know like they're just they're like I, I want I'm sure a lot of these tech companies like want to be able to like fix that and equal it out, and I know it's like a huge issue right now. But mm -hmm. um, on the same hand, like it, it's also hard to find people to fill those roles too. Right. So, but that's something that like you know if if that was something I told myself like at while starting a company, like if I have the opportunity, like you know I want to have you know to have yeah not have that be a problem. Right. Yeah. I think it's great. I think it's great what you're doing. Yeah. So um, let's do, I think we have time for one more. So this is from Michael Dwyer. Do you ever think about the increasing the top speed of these <laughs> and letting a few loose in the park? In addition to nature viewing, battle bots, a community race pool would be fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. Yes to both. Yes. So um, yeah, we would love to do that. Um, I guess I want. I just wanted to go back to the previous question sure. real, real quick, because um, uh, yeah, I guess I, I didn't think I didn't have like an answer for that quite. What I what I would say maybe is um, if if you want to like as a woman in tech, like try try to do well like working in tech and like get ahead. I'd say um, maybe focus more on like and this is just some idea. Like I, I'm not even sure if it's a good idea, but I I'd say. Focus on getting in a startup early right. and uh, being a key influencer in who that startup hires and being a key influencer in the culture. And then um, maybe then, like, you know, kind of fixing that from the bottom up. Sure. It's sort of hard with like a company like Uber where it's like a big systemic issue and it's probably going to be impossible to fix. But if you start at a smaller company, like, you might have a better chance. Gotcha. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So uh, I think that's it for today's Q&A. If you would like to learn more about robotics, visit udacity.com forward slash robotics. And don't forget to sign up for our Slack community at robotics.udacity.com. Jillian, thank you very much for your time today. It's yeah, been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks it's for coming fun. in. <laughs>